Our lives are written one chapter at a time. For Eddie Donaldson, his chapters could each be novels of their own. From thriving in the dark to rising in the light, he has countless pages written in languages of loss and love, described in music and art. He created an industry at an intersection of graffiti art and corporate activations, bridging two very different worlds for the benefit of both. Today, we benefit as he shares a few personal chapters of his own. So it seems to me that life unfolds in chapters. For you, Eddie Donaldson, your chapters, each of them seems to be a novel of its own. So I'd like to go through your life one chapter at a time, uh, taking us from where you began to where you are now and fill us into the journey that has been you. So let's start here. Chapter one, childhood. Tell us a story here, Eddie. What was it like? Well, uh, you know, as some of you know, probably I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. So I grew up in a small town. I uh, was a single child, or an only child to a single mom. Um, you know, and it was life in Louisville. I uh, went to private school, Catholic, all meals Catholic school for high school, played every sport possible that I had time for, um, and was a little preppy kid, you know, wore turtlenecks and moccasins and corduroys, and, you know, fashion was everything for me. Uh, my mom, worked at a place called Starving Artists, which was an actor's theater at Louisville. So I was around a very eclectic group of people, like her friends were anybody from musicians to actors to business people. So I was lucky to have that like super diverse background so I could understand different cultures and different religions and different races from a upfront and close, up close and personal perspective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a very interesting, and what a beautiful childhood to have so many different facets introduced to you at such yeah. a young age. It was um, interesting. <laughs> <to say> the <laughs> what would you say is one of your favorite childhood memories? I mean, there's so many that I'm not going to give one. I mean, just, you know, I lost my mom at 16, so I would say eating breakfast at my house and my mom would cook breakfast for me, you know, just or dinner, being at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there's also things that kind of stand out, you know, like I was talking to somebody the other day and like when I joined the basketball team and the football team at Trinity High School, I just remember walking in that locker room and seeing like respect, loyalty and integrity on the wall and like how that was a, a, a level up or, you know, like a, a, you know, a step forward in, in my adult, my adolescence, you know, and then there was a time where when I went to St. Francis, our eighth grade retreat, I snuck alcohol on the retreat and I got a bunch of us drunk, um, for probably some people for the first time. And we all got in trouble and we weren't going to be able to graduate. So my mom went to the headmaster and was like, no, my kid's graduating and so are the rest. And it just was really nice to have a mom that just just had your back like that you know like I wore my tuxedo and went on stage and took my abacus and all my friends took theirs and it was just a, you know proud moment of like oh shit you know like wow mom's has got your back even when you're dead wrong you know <laughs> so, I have so many uh memories you know mm-hmm mm -hmm. go for 20 minutes well um let's so so let's talk a moment uh chapter two Let's talk about your mom. Let's talk about Gloria. Let's talk about the loss of your mom. Yeah. What happened? Well, uh, one day I was at school. I was coming home to buy a new Volkswagen Scirocco, right? That we had been seeing on my bus route for months. And I was just turning 16. And I was all excited because we were going to go buy it that day. And I pulled up to my house and there was a bunch of BMX bikes on my porch or in the front yard. And I was like, what the hell are these kids doing in my house before I get home? Doors open. I walked in and found out that my mom was in the hospital. So 
associate an aneurysm, uh, sudden aneurysm at the age of 36, which at that time there was no medical treatment to fix aneurysms like this. So shortly thereafter, she lost her life. Uh, just based on the childhood memories you shared, um, I can't imagine how, how difficult that must have been for you. It was tough. I mean, I was an only child, so you can only imagine that's all I knew. I mean, my dad was around, but he wasn't really all that. We didn't have a great relationship, you know. Mm -hmm. so it was quite devastating, you know, to have to uproot my life. And, you know, I went to, to jail or to juvie after being, you know, just misbehaving based on that death or that, that, that situation. And so I'd probably say I was there another month after she passed away until my aunt had to come and get me out of juvie. <laughs> and I was thrown out of the state of Louisville or state of Kentucky until the age of 21. I couldn't return. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I got lucky because the, my godfather was the prosecutor his best friend was the judge and my mom's good friend was the defense attorney. So it was like, you know, so you're either going to go to jail till you're 21 or you're going to go live with your aunt until you're 21 and not return. And I actually had the audacity to ask, well, what about jail? And they were like, hmm, not really. You're going to leave California. And I did. I mean, you're going to leave Kentucky and go to California, so I did. So yeah, it was, it was quite a quite a transition, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And like speaking of transition, it's like one of the things, you know, there's obviously going to school and it's like, all, you know, essays and white beaters and dickies. And I was like, where am I? You know, like, this is crazy. I thought this was only on TV. You know, and then there was back to school shopping where it's like, I got a thousand dollars in lands and a thousand dollars in LLP and then I'm getting $250 to go to Kmart. You know, and right. I was like, what are we getting here? Socks and, and you know, buying socks and underwear. And she was like, no, you're going back to school shopping here. And I was like, I mean, I honestly didn't even realize I had clothes probably at that point. Yeah. Like yeah. people could shop there. She kind of was a, a life jerker you know, like a wake up call, I guess. Well, for sure. And so when we talked about, we get into chapter three, which would be your LA transition, that that's how it began. Yeah. Um, so this whole new reality that you weren't prepared for, you weren't ready for, it was a complete 180. It sounds like it. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, I quickly adapted I would say, you know, because I'm, I'm, I kind of pride myself on being a chameleon. I can exist in any environment. Didn't really understand it at that time, but, you know, I just did what I had to do. I mean, I got thrown out of a few schools, ended up at a magnet school called Sherman Oak CES. And I remember quitting in 10th grade. I was an 18 year old 10th grader, you know, and uh, I was selling drugs. You know, and I was in class and I, I, I say social studies, but that might be my computer brain remembering it accurately or me just saying that because I hated the class. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I got, I was, my pager at the time was going off and I was like, you know, you get a number 150, 75, 50, 200. And I got up to like $500 and I was like, may I use a restroom? And I never went back to school, you know, because I did whatever I needed to from the age of 16 to 18 to, to mask the pain and have enough money to buy whatever I felt would make me happy, whether it would be two cars and two motorcycles by the time I was 18. You know, I just, you know, I just, I, I adapted and masked the pain through hustle survival and put it, throwing myself in harm's way, I would say. Wow. So again, so such a huge contrast to the life you had before. Yeah. Um, you know, so then, I mean, that quickly takes us into, I mean, chapter four, which is street life, which again, could be a novel all its own, but tell us about, about that. What was, what was that reality like for you? Um, I mean, it's, you know, I, I moved into an, uh, 
it wasn't really a rough neighborhood, but it wasn't a nice neighborhood either. I moved into Lake Terrace, California, which is right near Pacoima. Um, I was already selling drugs back at home. So I knew how to sell drugs. I started selling drugs because of selling firecrackers on 4th of July. I was such a good firecracker salesman. My drug dealer introduced me to weed and I was like, oh, I can do that too. All year round, this is great. So when I got here, there was a 7-Eleven really, uh, right next door to my aunt's house. And I'd see this guy wearing a Chicago Bull starter jacket, some brand new Jordans and all creased up every day. And I'm going in there with a dollar fifty to, you know, buy a bag of chips and a soda. Like, what the hell? You know? Mm -hmm. So I just hit him up and was like, yo, I need to be like you, bro. What's going on? So that started my uh, drug sales career here in, in Los Angeles. Um, I stood in front of the 7-Eleven every day for a couple hours and try to get my $200 a day. And then it graduated through the ranks of that organization to in muscle because I was like this rough country kid that everybody couldn't figure out. And just my presence made people nervous, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of kept going, you know, just it's never enough, you know? So, you know, that went on for a while. And then I met some graffiti kids in the Valley, like some, some Encino kids with a little paper that were vandalizing, not because they needed to, but because they just wanted to have fun, you know, lived in these nice houses and were running around writing on stuff and stealing from 7-Eleven and, and, and hardware stores. I was like, this is my tribe. Like, I like this, you know? And I also liked the, the, the camaraderie of the Brotherhood of Graffiti. It was like a crew. It was like a gang without being in a gang, you know, but it was gang-like. We had some some surly situations pop up early on and still do at times. Um, but I just got comfortable. You know, I found a home with these guys from this crew called the Chosen Few or the city's finest in the valley um, from Mystic and Rage and, and Boo. You know, just, they just took me in and accepted me for who I was, you know, and it just felt good. So I stayed, I stayed around um, and became a graffiti artist and I wasn't very good at it. So I graduated to the business side of things and started trying to make paper for everybody. And that's how I was able to keep my seat at the table was I was getting these guys some of their first commercial jobs and it was cool. You know, I mean, we literally were going to liquor stores. This is before everything was cool. We'd paint liquor stores for free because we wanted a roll call on the side of the building, which is, you know, all of our names, you know, mm -hmm. so. And I'm like, these guys, I'm watching these, these liquor store owners who were overjoyed at what we had done or what they had done. And I was like, they gotta wanna pay for this. And they're like, nah, I don't think so. I'm like, well, let me try. Next thing you know, we're getting paid decent, decent money for a 22, 20 year old, you know? For a day's worth of doing what you love and then it just spawned into a much bigger thing me getting corporate dollars and, and bridging corporate america to the feed and, and hip-hop culture which is and that just like is so awesome so mind-blowing to me the fact that if your business mind you could just see let's turn something criminal into something that's corporately supported <laughs> right I mean, yeah i've never heard it quite put that way and i've answered that question like 30 times um, I mean, and then there was the other side too. I was a really big fan of hip hop. I was in a break dance crew in Louisville called the Unique Breakers, where we used to go to bars and just make three, four hundred dollars a night from people tipping us from, you know, spinning on our heads. And once again, I wasn't very good, but I was able to, to, to find the opportunities where we could go in these bars and get paid. You know, it was like, I'm, I've always been like the, the guy next to the guy, right? So out of my love for hip hop, I started a, a street team company called called Gorilla One actually. And we worked for all, most of the major labels in the nineties on the hip hop side. So we worked records for all, you know, no need to name drop, but every major label in the nineties and the birth of hip hop here in Los Angeles. So, you know, from Ruthless Records to Bad Boy Records, you know, to and we didn't ever work with Death Row, but you know, East Coast and West Coast, you know, we had a sweet spot with bringing East Coast bands here in LA to perform live, you know, mm -hmm. um, and also work the records at radio and retail. So I, I, I had the street, it just helped with this, me, it helped me stay and stay valuable and relevant in the streets because I had the graffiti artists on one side, which were helping me do all the work for the labels. So not only were we getting painting jobs and t-shirt jobs, but we were also getting paid to spray paint names of these artists all over the, all over the city and then and beyond the city too. Um, 
So that was kind of a big part of my, my me, you know, kind of establishing my, my, my foundation here in Los Angeles was just, you know, running the streets in a way, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any, when it comes to your street life chapter, was, I'd love to hear like the, your, your, your favorite moment there. And, and also the other side of it, like, what was the scary? I'm sure there are times that were uncomfortable. Is there a time from both of those sides that you could, I'm just curious. There's just so much that it's hard to summarize in one thing, but mm -hmm. I will say, I mean, I, I think the thing I, you know, with this, the graffiti thing, I think just having such a, you know, I mean, I have a family, you know, mm -hmm. I have a family, I have a worldwide family of people that I can count on and call on. And, and a lot of people in this world don't have that, you know, we're all alone here supposedly right and but we're not so i think that was kind of that's probably my takeaway from that one is that you know forget the money that everybody's made the millions of dollars that people are still making today based on what we did and what we do but for me it's just about the brotherhood you know and we've lost a couple of those brothers you know but i think that was that would that's what i take away from graffiti and on the music side i think i stood next to so many famous people when they were not famous the likes of like Nas and Jay Z and Biggie Smalls and you know the Tupacs. It's like I'm in the room with these guys when they're as hungry as they've ever been because they're not there yet, and that shit's contagious, you know, to be around that. And I took it for granted. I had no idea what we were doing. We were just living our life, and all of a sudden, here we are. Our life is everybody's life, you know. We got you know soccer moms bumping Biggie Smalls now, so. It, it's that, that's 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 I'm proud of that you know I'm really proud of that you know not that I figured it out it, it figured it out for me I'm not a genius but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have been there for the birth of for the birth of some of these these things and people and places you know um on the bad side I mean you know shit was dangerous you know I'm you know now that I'm sober again because I've been going in and out forever but now that I'm sober you know, the shame and humiliation pops up on some of the things, some of the, you know, just the lifestyle that I chose for so long, the things that I did, people that I might have hurt or harmed or hurt, you know, whether directly or indirectly. I wish I could re relive some of those choices, you know. Um, it's a necessary part of what we were doing at that time to survive, so I'm not necessarily uh, regretful. Um, because, you know, I walked a fine line out there. I was always respectful and decent, but dangerous, you know, and that's that's a, a good fucking task within itself. You know, that lifestyle led me to getting shot once and stabbed a few times, you know, I'm almost losing my life. But I don't necessarily regret that part as much as some of the things that I did to other people or in other situations I found myself. You know, I put myself in a situation, I put myself in harm's way. So that's a consequence of that of that choice and that action. But you know, if I could take back a few of the things that I did, I probably would. Mm -hmm. Especially now that I'm entering this whole, or I've entered this whole new you know, spiritual, you know, not kind of very spiritual life, which mm -hmm. leads which leads us to chapter five. <laughs> <laughs> now coming into chapter five, turn the page into spiritual journey because this is a really special place in your life, the place that you are now, um, the place where I have come to know you and appreciate and respect. And um, how, did, how did this chapter begin? Hmm. Well, it started when the next girlfriend took me to Agape, you know, along. I mean, I was always spiritual. I, went to, I was part of a Baptist church as a child. I went every week. Went on Wednesdays. I sang in the choir, you know, ran the collection basket, all mandatory things to do from my mother and my, my grandmother, not by choice. I wasn't like, hey, I want to sing, you know, I was just, you're going to do this. And I was like, okay. Um, so it's always been there, but I think, you know, when my mom died, um, 
wasn't real fond of God. Okay. Matter of fact, I remember, you know, at the age of probably, 20, I don't know, in my early 20s, I wanted to fight him. And I used to actively request him to come down here so we could look each other in the eye and I could give him a hot biscuit in the mouth and then I'd be all right, you know? You know, drunk, wasted, like, just come down here. I'll, I'll be a priest for the rest of my life if you just show yourself and let me man in with you real quick. So I left, the, the, I left my faith behind early, um, you know, one of our phrases was fuck karma, I'll take my chances, you know? Um, but, so fast forward to Brandy takes me to Agape. I'm starting to get the message, I'm with it. You know, Anthony Robbins books are out, like I'm getting a self-help vibe, right? Like, you know, waking the giant within, I'm like jumping around, it's cool. But I was always, you know, one foot in, one foot out. You know, um, but when I finally decided to take both feet out was when I had my first daughter, Chloe. You know, I had an episode happen where I woke up one night with my daughter in one hand and a gun in the other in a, in a PTSD uh, fit. And I was like, I got to get out of this shit completely. I can't have these two. These two worlds can't exist together. If I'm going to be a father, I have to be a good man. And being a good man means letting go of these tools that I've acquired, you know, out of my pain and struggles, my, you know, my defense mechanisms or whatever. So then fast forward to about five years ago, I had an incident happen in my life where I drank too much and I did something that I'm horribly ashamed of to someone that I cared about deeply and still do. Um, and after that, somewhat violent act i decided that i needed to change my life completely and i dove into kundalini yoga and in kundalini yoga i found that i can forgive myself and i can be my genuine self my authentic self without fear of being being made or being caught that i'm a nice guy you know it's okay to be a nice guy and it, it's a challenge still and those of you who who um, have to be around me regularly, but not, you, know, you, you know what I mean. But, but I, I, I am a nice guy now through Kundalini Yoga, and it's and I found out it's okay to be nice. It's okay to be sensitive. It's okay to be to be myself, such a childlike human being. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, through Kundalini Yoga, I've, here I am today, and that's how we met. Actually, is based on that progress and that, that, that work that I had done. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how exciting is it that um, these five chapters that we've explored are just the beginning of so many more chapters to come. What are you most excited about? We've looked back and looking ahead, Eddie, what are you most excited about when you look forward to what's possible? Hmm. Just to do a question. I think uh, which there's a few things again. You know, I'm so multifaceted. And I'm answering from five different brains and mouths, right? I think you know, I'm going to be corny, but I think people that actually get to know who I really am. You know. I'm not going to get all philosophical and be like, well, it's going to be great to live my life through this new lens. It's like, that's cool. But I think just people getting to know who I really am, you know, especially people who have known me for a long time, they've known the, the falsehoods of the image that I created for myself. Mm -hmm. think, you know, I like, I like who I am today and I hope everyone else does. And I honestly don't even really hope it because if you, if people are around me and they see who I really am, there's nothing not to like, you know, all that other bullshit's put to the side. You know, I'm a man of service, you know, I, mm. I of service every day without expectation in return a lot, you know, so don't take that too literal mm. if you're listening. But, you know, I, I think for people to get to know who I really am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what comfort, what safety there is in that just to be able to be your authentic self. 100%, 100. I mean, 
you know, yeah. I mean, just like, it's like Joey, you know, we met through Joey mm -hmm. and Emma and, you know, that journey alone, you know, me and Joey both have been on both sides of this thing, you know, in a real way. You know, I used to work with Joey, Fed sitting outside our house, watching the house, you know, probably tapping phones. And now me and Joey get to just be ourselves and relax and not be that guy, you know, mm -hmm. just sometimes shut up and listen instead of know everything and dictate and manipulate you know it's just nice to to allow life to happen versus think I know what's best for myself and, and create scenarios that I think are perfect for me which really aren't you know so mm -hmm. I look forward to that that's awesome um I guess to close out this conversation um certainly there are more chapters to come that i look forward to with you um for people who aren't there yet who are still back in chapter one chapter two who um who are trying to find their way what advice would you have can you think back on a time where you really you started to find yourself you found your course for those people who feel completely lost right now eddie what advice do you have for someone who has finally felt found i mean that's a multi-part answer as well you know i never i don't think i was ever lost even when i was out there i was okay you know i wasn't lost i was just away from my spirit I was comfortable there. Um, but what I will say is, you know, if you just let go and let God, whatever that means, whatever you, to your understanding, whether it's higher power, whether it's whatever it is, just let go and let God. You don't have to try to find anything. It finds you. And that, to me, is like the most amazing concept in the world, as simple as it sounds. It's like, I don't, you know, if you're if you're out there in the streets and you're doing shit you're not proud of, that that'll change your circumstance. Your current circumstance right now is right now, and that's all it is. It's already gone. And now that I was just speaking about, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And now it's gone. Now it's gone. There is only now. There's only the, this moment. And if I can change, anybody can change. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I tell people. That are like, man, I don't know what to do. I can't get out of this shit. Yes, you can. If I can change, you can change. Because I was a very selfish person. And I was addicted to causing pain and suffering. Mentally, emotionally, physically, all of it. Like, if I'm hurting, everybody else is hurting too. And I was hurting for 30 plus years. So, if I can come out of that shit, so can anyone else. You know, it, it's there's a life out there waiting for everybody. It's not the life that you're waiting for. It's the life that's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Is that a great answer? Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, usually I've got stuff to say. I've got nothing. Um, Eddie, thank you so much for sharing these amazing chapters of you. Thank you so much for helping all of us become just that much more aware now. Thank you.